Good afternoon from World War II TV. I'm Paul Woodadge. I'm very excited about this show today because it is my first one where I'm venturing out of my comfort shores, of comfortable shores of Normandy. And we're bringing you a show from Poland today, Warsaw, on the 76th anniversary of the beginning of the Warsaw Uprising. And my guests today are joining from Poland, but Canadian is Dr. Alexandra Ritchie, who has written and talked and lectured about the Warsaw Uprising and other events in Europe extensively. Good afternoon, Alex. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, a pleasure. Great pleasure. And live on the streets is my friend Alina Novo. Oh, no, I've got it wrong now. I just said it correctly. <laughs> and now as soon as the button went wrong, I can't say it now. Novobilska. Novobilska, there we go. Okay. It, it worked a second ago and then two seconds later my brain failed. And Alina is going to be walking some of the streets of Poland, not the whole uh, area of sorry, Warsaw, because it's a very large city, but she'll be taking us through some of the key sites uh, that are, we're going to talk about during the show. So um, good afternoon, Alina. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi, thank you so much for bringing me on. And the weather is looking pretty stunning there, so um, that's good. So um, the event, we'll, we'll get into this uh, very shortly, but the event officially started at 5 p.m. on uh, August the 1st, but of course shots had actually been fired already, so this time of day things had actually just about started, but we'll, we'll go back to the origins of this. So we're bringing this to you live on the day, that's exactly what we're trying to do here at World War II TV, and again I say at the beginning, click subscribe, click the bell to get the notifications, and you can find information about their books and what Alina does. Alina of course is one half of the amazing History Hack podcast with Alex, Alex Churchill, and uh, you can find her on Twitter as World War II Girl, but anyway, Let's start with, with Alex. And so for those watching who, who aren't familiar with it, what's the whole context of the Warsaw Uprising? How did this, how did it get to a point where a city kind of explodes 76 years ago today? Well, it's, it's, it's quite a complicated thing, but to try and do it really simply, um, the Poles of course are invaded by the Germans 1st of September, 1939, 17th of September, the Soviets come into the other half of Poland. They've divided the country up between them. Uh, the war is brutal. The Germans then um, go off and attack the Soviet Union. Uh, and the, um, the Poles, from the very, very beginning, are determined to fight back. And they create the largest uh, underground movement in uh, all of occupied Europe. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people are involved. They're all vetted. It's all very carefully done. Both a, a civilian side, where they've got secret schools and universities, because all those things were closed by the Germans. And then on the other side, uh, military organization. And from the very beginning, the idea was to resist the Germans at any, every turn and to also, when the war was changing, to help whichever ally was going to come in and, and liberate Poland. At the very beginning of the war, they thought it might even be the Americans and the Brits. But as the war progressed, it was obvious that it was going to be the Soviets. Uh, move up to 1944. Um, Originally, the idea was never to have an uprising in Warsaw because General Borkomorowski, who was the leader of the AK in Poland, thought this would cause too much damage to the civilians and to the property and, and, and everything else. So there was always the idea of having it out in the countryside or whatever. But everything changes in the summer of 1944 because of the Soviet summer offensive. All of a sudden, the Soviets had been way over past Stalingrad, you know, just sweep through uh, in Vitebsk and Orsha and, and Minsk Falls. And all of a sudden, the Soviet juggernaut is coming up toward the Polish border. Now, this brings all sorts of very good things because the Germans are on the, on the run, but also bad things because they know by this point that Stalin intends to have political ambition in Poland. He set up a, a, a pub, puppet government in Lublin in July. And, uh, and so the, uh, the headquarters of the AK say, you know, maybe we should change our mind. We need to give the world some sort of major gesture to show that we did something to liberate ourselves and invited the Soviets into our city, our liberated city, um, as victors, as, as people who mm. liberated themselves. This is a big, huge political argument, they think, against Soviet domination after the war. So this is the sort of key uh, idea behind it. Um, and unfortunately, there were a great number of miscalculations made just at the last minute. And this caused, uh, you know, effectively the disaster that follows. So I think the thing that strikes me in the beginning is you've got a highly organized underground army. It's not perhaps like the resistance of some other countries where it is just sort of farmers going out, picking up rifles. It's a, most of them have military training, they have background, but 
they haven't got the resources to fight anything like a long campaign. Whatever they've got is going to be short and swift because they, you know, that you're talking about platoons with one rifle, six pistols, and the rest to just have to, you know, wait the, for a, for a weapon to come along. So with that sort of resources, when everything is going to be decisive, and of course, as we find out, a 63-day battle in, uh, takes place, which of course they haven't got the resources to to well. We'll talk about airdrops and things later on. And then they're hoping, of course, the Russians are going to come in. So, Alina, I'll bring you in because and I'll unmute you because you're, you're that, just a little bit noisy where you are. But, um, you know, you're, where are you right now, Alina? Tell us where we're going to be walking today. So, uh, for those of you who don't know how big Warsaw is, it's absolutely enormous. And what we wanted to do is just physically just not possible for me to be going from one end of the city to the other. So I've pinpointed a specific area of Warsaw that we're going to be walking around. So we're walking around for Vishla, which is down by the river. Um, it's in between the old town and uh, Midtown. And basically, as Paul's showing you on the map right there, exactly where I am, I'm standing in front of the Kudabara Memorial. And I've decided to bring in quite a personal element uh, to the show because we're actually going to be walking around where my grandfather was fighting during the Warsaw Uprising. Which is uh, interesting because we're going to see quite a few different exciting and interesting things. But before we go on to um, our W, I'm just going to talk about uh, what happened just before. Yeah, we've got a little bit of wind coming affecting it there a little bit, but. Um, I will okay. move in a moment. Yeah. So um, I don't know if Alex wants to jump in uh, about Jolie Bush just before, and then I can uh, jump in on our W. Well, so what happens is that is that the um, the Aka leadership have decided they're going to call the uprising to begin at five o'clock on the first of August, nineteen forty four, and um, and and this is because they believe mm -hmm. that um, that the Soviets are just about to come into the city. What's actually happened is that this German general Walter Model has coddled together the uh, Viking SS and the Totenkopf SS and the Nineteenth Panzer and the Hermann Göring division from all over Europe. And they are waiting for the Red Army just outside of Warsaw. So they slam into the Red Army on 31st of July. And the Aka leadership thinks, oh, this is um, the sound of the Soviet successful Soviet offensive on their way to Warsaw. And there's, there's false intelligence that the Soviets are already on the eastern part of, uh, of Warsaw itself. This is not true. It was, it was incorrect information. So they make this decision very, very last minute, very hurried. Okay, we've got to start right now, because if we don't start right now, the Soviets are gonna come in and the whole point of this is gonna be lost. So the, the decision was made very, very quickly. Uh, the, the uprising was called and, uh, and everybody starts getting around the city because they, they, the units are told, okay, mobilize right away. Uh, it's five o'clock in the afternoon. So of course people are at work, you know, people are stuck in different parts of town. And all of a sudden um, uh, they start to mobilize, get to their units. And, uh, and there are some skirmishes that happen before five o'clock. So there's one particularly in Jollibosch where the Germans see this group of young men, you know, having funny looking things that might be guns under a funny looking raincoats, which is boiling hot, you know, which is obviously not, not right. And so they, there's some shooting already in Jollibosch and there's some other skirmishes as well that happen around the, around, uh, the whole city. But the whole city is mobilized. As you said before, this is a very... Uh, you know, a, a truly a military operation. People are in units, they've got commanding officers. It's, it's all very, very carefully done. And so this is what happens. So at five o'clock, the, the beginning of the uprising officially uh, happens and there's shooting all over the place. And there are units which have specific targets, bridges, uh, airports, and so on. And they start going for these targets. And in some ways, it's typical of many of these sort of previous in history. I mean, I think about the 1916 Easter uprising in Dublin, this idea of we've got a city, let's take out some key positions, let's work to the things like the post office, the communication centres, schools, buildings that can be defended, buildings that are important, uh, sitting on important junctions. So it's been well thought out. Obviously, clearly, from my reading, and you'll back me up, it's the communication is what lets them down at the beginning. They just simply cannot communicate to all their forces around the city that it's all happening at the same time. It's not like you can, you know, do a Twitter announcement and set up an event. It's going to be all busy. And I was reading an account of one guy who was visiting his mother and father and was having a bath in their bath when it all started off and had no idea. Um, so that fascinates me that you've got an organized force, but you've got to get them organized. And that's, 
that's that's going to take that's time. So a very important issue. But the other very important issue, as you mentioned already, is that they were very underpowered. It's impossible yeah. for a group of ten guys with a few um, pistols to take a highly heavily defended airport that's being defended by an entire German unit. It's impossible to take a bridge with ten guys when you've got concrete bunkers and, and guys like a hundred Germans with submachine guns waiting on, on the other side. So, you know, it's, it, it was the, these targets that Colonel Monter chose were almost impossible for the Poles to mm. seriously have gotten. Well, I think we should also mention Walter Modal there as well, because people watching this will be very familiar with him turning up at Arnhem, um, you know, and, and his forces there. So they, they'll know him from that engagement there, because it's fair to say that the Polish misunderstood how speedy and large a German reaction could be. Uh, they, they had kind of thought the war was turning more in the Allied favor than it was, and they were very surprised by just how many Germans they could throw at the battle. So tell us about what Mo, what Modal bring in. Perhaps we're going a bit ahead of ourselves, but what forces he brings in later on. Because um, you're, you're, you're broadcasting from the, the 5th Viking headquarters, aren't you? Well, yeah, the, I mean, because there are two separate things really going on. Walter Modal's counter counteroffensive is takes place just outside of Warsaw and he slams, as I said, the Viking SS and Totenkopf and 19th Panzer Hermann going into the Red Army, to the second uh, tank uh, army, and they decimate. These are the largest tank battles on Polish soil. Uh, mm. Over 350 Soviet tanks are knocked out. Um, and, and, you know, so it's a very, very big deal. This is happening in parallel to the uprising. So what happens with the uprising is that uh, it begins 1st of August. Himmler and Hitler get wind of it. Himmler goes to see Hitler in the Wolfschanze and he finds Hitler, you know, purple in the face, his eyes bulging, he's absolutely enraged that the Poles dare to do this stuff. And he and Himmler devise what's called the order for Warsaw that night. It's issued on the first of, even a, evening on the 1st of August, where they say, every combatant will be killed. Every man, woman and child in Warsaw will be killed and then the city is going to be leveled to the ground. So in order to carry that out, a whole different uh, bunch of guys are brought in by Himmler. And Himmler get, brings in Erich von der bach Zaleski and various other generals and, and, and colonels and so on, including some of the disgusting SS people that he's been fighting with the anti-partisan war in Belarus, including probably the, one of the worst thugs uh, ever in, in World War II history, Oskar Dolewanger, who was a disgusting human being, um, Bronislav Kom uh, Kaminsky, who was a, a Russian turn, uh, turncoat, uh, who had a kind of bu bunch of guys who were also working with von der Bach-Zaleski. And all these guys are, are coddled together, and they're the ones who, who go in and target Warsaw. So it was the largest uh, ground combat um, SS operation in World War II. It was absolutely brutal because of the SS because it was done by the SS. It wasn't the regular Wehrmacht. It wasn't mm -hmm. Walter Modal who was responsible for this. They, they had to coordinate, but, the, but this was a yeah. different operation. And I think for those regular viewers of what we've been doing the last few weeks, this is, this is so different from Normandy in that, yes, there are some small scale SS reprisals against villagers and POWs in Normandy, but to a certain degree, things are fought with a fairly a fair amount of chivalry and POWs are taken and we're limiting, we're trying both sides to limit civilian casualties. This is the absolute opposite of this. And for those who have perhaps read about Normandy or Italy, if you haven't read about Warsaw, that the brutality the, the, uh, and the, the revenge and the, 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 the death toll is just catastrophic and we'll cover that during the, the, uh, the show as it goes on. So, so Alina, let's bring it back you in again. Um, so where, where are we heading first uh, on your little walk around Warsaw? So we're starting off, we're going to be talking about the Palais Amsterdam. Uh, and we, I've actually brought you to one of the spots for our W, which I find a really interesting story. So the Palais Amsterdam was split into three groups. Uh, you had Beach, uh, which is the Pogani Konrad, which is third group Konrad, and Elektrovnia, which is uh, translated more or less like a power station. Sort of. right. And behind me, I'm going to switch the camera around so you guys can see this better. So you have this street right here. And just coming down this street here, before five o'clock, the units were hidden and dotted around from the uh, beach. And basically, they were so hyped up. They were so, you know, they're on the verge. They're going to fight. For their freedom and there was a German unit marching literally down the street where I'm standing right now 
And one of the young guys, his pseudonym was Swan, he got too overexcited, he was too rattled. He had a grenade in his hand, he pulls out the pen, runs towards this German leader. And the Germans obviously see him, they shoot him to the ground, and they see that he's holding something in his hand. And this happens all in a matter of seconds. Mm. And the grenade explodes. So in his death, he takes out a group of SS men literally moments before five o'clock, before our W. So I thought I'd start here with our W and then we're going to walk down. This is uh, Street Tampa. Actually, what else you can see in front of us is the um, shopping museum, which was also a palace at one point as well. So the units operated all around here in Povishla. Wow. So I've got a couple of photos of those watching of, of the street Kalina's in. Um, obviously, a lot has changed since World War II. The town was, city was rebuilt, but these are all, uh, I've got a couple of photos here taken in the street where Alina is, and the Germans had some armoured vehicles. Alex will talk about this later on. I'll show another, another one quickly. Um, but it, this is, this is um, all where it all began. But this is, I'm excited to be to bringing this to you. This is again the same street there. You can kind of get the same buildings. Obviously, they've been replaced these days. And we were talking before the show went live. There's a remarkable number of photos available from the uprising. And Alex, Alex you, you told me, but for, for the benefit of the audience, I mean, I was staggered how much material there is. So just run through why there is so much available. Well, one of the things was that the Akka had film units. They had actually professional cameramen and women and um, went through the city as the battles were, were being fought and uh, took these incredible films um, and also photographs. And so there's a, there's a huge record and a lot of this material was, was saved, thank goodness. It, it, it was um, uh, salvaged. So, and the Germans also took footage for their Wochenschau and, and all the other, other um, German uh, uh, film uh, projects. So there's an awful lot of evidence still of what happened and, and photographs of, of really every district. That's no, remarkable stuff. So um, again, Alina as well, Alina's walking along the street there. Tell us about those first few, uh, few minutes and hours. I mean, Alina told us that dramatic story of the grenade, but these type of incidents are being repeated over the, the, over the city, aren't they? So what are the notable exactly. first actions? So the, the, the uh, Colonel Monter had chosen a number of um, very important sites in his view that the Poles had to take airports, bridges, and so on. So the, 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 the best units, the best equipped units are sent after, sent to go and take those things. And they're almost all of them end in disaster with, with the exception of the power station, but the, the bridges aren't taken, the airports aren't taken. But what does happen is that the Aka take over huge residential and, and office districts in, in the city. And then what happens is the, the people of Warsaw core out of their apartment buildings, their houses, their offices, and they start to build barricades. So there's this jubilation, this absolute moment of celebration when they, you know, for the first time in five years, they have, they've had to have a curfew, they haven't been able to speak, you know, Polish, they've been, not been able to do so many things. And all of a sudden they can sing their national anthem, they can, they can speak with each other without fear and so on. And there's this tremendous outpouring. And, they, and, the, and the civilians, who are really kind of the heroes of the moment, because mm. whereas the Aka has actually failed to achieve most of its military objectives, um, kind of by hook or by crook, the population uh, creates this environment in the city. And unfortunately, because the um, communication links, the rail, the rail and the big huge streets haven't been taken by the Poles for the large part, these districts are separated like big chunks of the city with Germans around them and big chunks of the city with Germans around them. And, and so this is, this of course, later on is very important because the Germans don't just take Warsaw in one go. They take one district, they liquidate it, they take another district, liquidate it, and they go like a, like a chessboard, one mm. piece at a time. And so that's very important for the later on um, aspects. But at the very beginning, there was this absolute outpouring of joy, jubilation, delight, happiness. Um, and, and, and incidentally, just when we're walking here, you can see these buildings are almost all uh, built in the communist era because most of Warsaw was absolutely flattened. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it, it, what's, again, what strikes me is just that the, 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 the events on the ground are happening without very much information. The civilians coming out making, making barricades have no idea that they're part of this much larger, almost political discussion going on and Stalin. And we said before we went live, we, I didn't want to go too much into the uh, 
the politics behind this, but into a sense, Warsaw is being used as a pawn by these 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 higher powers in their various political um, plans. I suppose I want to focus on what these people on the streets are happening, and for those who are not aware, the the Poles have had an absolutely horrible five years of warfare. I mean, dwarfing and belittling other countries and the, the, the savagery and the massacres after massacres and brutality after brutality. And you can imagine just if I was a Polish 17 year old kid there in the street and you're seeing something active hanging, finally you just join in, get in, get get out there and celebrate the fact we are, we are resisting and yet you've got this big organization behind it. So um, feel free to expand on those events as well. And when Alina's, I forget where Alina's, where, where she is right now, um, but she'll get to our next stop. And, and, and again, for those watching, Alina mentioned earlier, her grandfather was involved in this. And we'll show you a photo of her grandfather. And Alina was at a ceremony earlier today, and she put on Twitter that last year there were 12 Warsaw Uprising veterans in attendance. This year there was one with a further three who couldn't attend because they were too unwell. So it's an, another reminder of how very, very quickly now we are closing the door on being able to speak to people who are involved in this. And Alex, I know you've spoken to people who are involved in this and uh, many times Alina has. And oh, very much so. My, um, my, both my mother-in-law and my father-in-law were both in the uprising and my mother-in-law is bringing me to another point, which is very important, um, was in uh, the most elite unit, it was called Kedith. And in interestingly, Alina's grandfather was also in the same unit. This was a very, uh, a woman's sapper unit, which was very, very interesting. And they, and they blew lots of things up and she was making uh, bombs out of these big mortars that didn't explode and so on. So I have a lot of also personal, personal history mm. with the uprising as well. Um, but I have talked over the years to many, many people who both were fighting, but also who were civilians in the uprising. And it's, it, it's true that this generation is tragically going. I do a lot of work for the National World War II Museum, bringing mm. uh, Americans here. And we always had an evening with the veterans uh, of the uh, uprising, um, and and you know, year by year, you know, the group gets smaller and smaller, which is really really sad. And, and, and a good moment to mention a shout out for Sarah Kirksey here, who is our mutual friend, who got me in touch with your, yourself, Alex, and uh, Sarah works for World War II Museum. And without Sarah, Sarah's I wouldn't have got in touch brilliant. with you. So a little shout out to I don't know if Sarah's watching, but she'll watch it on playback. But Sarah's one of those. She's got a huge Absolutely. fan club in Europe, around the world, really, now. Um, yeah, she's so, a dear, dear friend. Wonderful person. So, Alina, it looks like you've stopped. So what are we looking at now? I have. Um, as we were talking about the destruction of Warsaw, I thought I'd show you one of the original buildings that still stands in the left. Um, it, I love this building. I think it's incredibly beautiful. The ceilings would be quite high and uh, not like a typical normal flat, you would think, with, uh, uh, with lowered ceilings. So mm -hmm. I love these buildings. But as Alex mentioned, a lot of these buildings are post-communist. I'm going to show you in the distance. I don't know if you can see that, that new apartment building. Yeah. yeah. Um, unfortunately, Povishla has been highly gentrified um, after the, well, now, because they've been tearing down buildings and building new apartments. So you see a mixture of very old original buildings, uh, mm. basically brand new uh, uh, as I call them, eyesores in this beautiful area, and obviously communist buildings like this mm. one here in front of me. No, I mean a staggering amount of history. And what is there a feeling? You know, you're there on the streets today. Is 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 the anniversary a big deal there? Would, is it with older people? Are younger people aware of it? What what's the feeling? Have you been stopping and having coffees in Starbucks? Do people understand? So Varsovians tend to understand about the Warsaw Uprising because. Uh, in layman's terms, it's shoved down their throats every year. Uh, this year, I've got some photos that I'll post on my personal Twitter account if anybody's interested. I was in the underground and they had these incredibly beautiful posters that said, at five o'clock, we will all stop. The whole city will stop. We remember. Mm. And everybody remembers. And actually, the siren does go off in every single city because it goes off in mine where I live in the south of Poland. So the whole of yes, Poland yes. remembers. And, and it's a very moving, very moving moment at five o'clock, wherever you are in Warsaw. I mean, there are obviously mm. official commemorations and so on, but it doesn't really matter where you end up. Of course, it's a little different now with the coronavirus um, because there aren't mm, so many people in the streets, but normally, you know, first of August is just a bustling, busy time. And, and yet all the trams, all buses, everything stops. And it's, it's just, it's, it's very, very moving. 
So, um, uh, the, the I'm not going to lie to you guys, so I'm just going to interrupt. I, I do cry every time at five o'clock. <laughs> every time at five o'clock, I cry. So I'm not going to lie about it. Alex is right. It's incredibly moving. And um, I just think of uh, my family on that day and what they felt and how they felt in those moments. Well, and that's exactly why you and Alex are on the show. We want people who can bring not only the, uh, the detail, but also the emotion behind it, because it's for most people watching it, they won't have a connection with Poland. I don't. And I, I, it's, I'm going to be learning about it from you two, you wonderful people. So, um, uh, so this the, the, you're saying, Alex, that the objectives have mostly not been been seized, but they have got this help of the civilians to, to create the uh, the um, the barricades, things like that. So German movement is going to be very, very difficult in a city like that. And and for the armor geeks watching, when we're talking about some of the self-propelled guns coming in with their open rears, the, the Marders and Stugs and things, some of them are very vulnerable to street fighting. They're not designed for the Panther tanks. There aren't many Panther tanks involved in the Warsaw Uprising, but they're not designed for fighting in cities. They're designed for fighting out on the, uh, well, the steps, but they were designed to combat the, the, the Russian vehicles out there. So no soldier in the German army, be they Wehrmacht or SS, is going to be wanting to go into an urban environment like this against an entirely hostile enemy. They don't know who will be friend and enemy around. I'm not, I'm not saying they're the heroes, the Germans. I'm just saying from the German soldier's point of view, it's a horrible, horrible environment to fight in. That's true, because I, I've talked to an, a number of them, read some of the memoirs, and um, there they, they, they were two, the Germans were really wrong footed. They, they sort of knew something might be happening at some point, but they didn't really expect this well coordinated, uh, and certainly not this for them absolute hell idea of of urban warfare with all these civilians and barricades is like the most the biggest nightmare you can imagine if you're yeah, just absolutely. an ordinary soldier and and there were two divisions that were that part of parts of divisions that were trapped actually on on this district called Bola and they were trying to get across the bridge to get to Walter Model because they you know for, as reinforcements part of a small part of the Hermann Göring division and a, and a, a part of the Viking SS and that's exactly what you said with the tanks they had terrible problems moving them this is when one of the one of the sort of horrible things that happens in the uprising to get these tanks out is that they 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 keep getting stopped by Molotov cocktails and people mm. and everything else uh, and snipers and everything and they um, they actually use uh, mostly women as human shields to get these tanks to the bridge and get out of Warsaw. So this is one of the first sort of um, crimes I suppose committed um, in in Warsaw. Um, but they they leave it they leave very quickly because that's the regular army they're trying to get to Walter Model. There's, there's a totally different fight going on, and then the the the, the real tragedy starts to begin when the SS uh, start to arrive. And this is uh, why we why the um, the Warsaw Uprising becomes so horrific. Why we stand at five o'clock and mourn the deaths of so many people because the first major attack starts in a district called Wola, which logically, of course, is is right on the western part of. Poland of, of Warsaw, and um, this is where the first SS troops under um, Erich von der uh, uh, come into the city, and they unleash um, Oskar Derlewanger's uh, group of thugs. And as I said, he their uh, role in Belarusia was to kill civilians. This anti-partisan war, they were totally brutalized, completely brutalized. They were also very efficient, good soldiers. This is this is them. Um, and, uh, and they start to massacre civilians. So the first thing they do is they surround apartment buildings and, uh, and they get people into the courtyards and they just mow them down. But they realize this isn't really efficient enough. This is by now we're at already at the 5th of August. Uh, this isn't efficient enough. So they get, there are about five or six big factories, uh, uh, Orsus factory, a big pasta factory. And they, um, they start getting the civilians into these big courtyards of these factories, uh, letting about 30 in at a time, pushing them in, and then just mowing them down, pushing another 30 or 40 people in on top of the bodies of the dead people, and then, and then murdering them and doing it again and again and again. And around about 40,000 civilians were massacred that day, 5th of August, uh, in Vola, in the Vola district. It's known as the Vola massacre um, and, is, and is one of the most horrific events in the Warsaw Uprising, of, of which there were many, many others. But this was one of the sort of biggest massacres. And then they organized, um, prisoners, uh, people taken off the street to, uh, to be in these things called Verbrennungskommandos, which were to set up to burn the bodies of the victims on the streets of Warsaw. I, mean, I, I always think as a student of military history that a battle will kind of show its colors very quickly. 
And it seems that this battle very, very, very quickly becomes barbaric and horrific on both sides. And these units, these German units, they're not, they're not doing this accidentally. This is their, they, this terror warfare is what they are going out to do. They're out there to torture and kill and maim and use civilians to, 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 to create terror. And the Molotov cocktails, which the, the, the Poles are using, of course, an effective weapon and they're using it out of desperation because they have nothing else. They don't have anti-tank weapons until they can be dropped them by the Allies. But but burning armored vehicles is horrific. I mean, you don't a crewman in a vehicle that's burning is horrible. So this this battle becomes very, very horrible very, very quickly. And and for those watching, when you're you casually throwing out a figure of 40,000 massacres, this is this is dwarfing things in the Western theater. So Alina. We've stopped at the power station now, I understand. So um, I'll show up the photo we've got of the power station that you've kindly sent me. I've got to find it. Um, Fine. I wanted to throw something in just before uh, I do talk about the power station. Uh, talking about the Vola massacre. So yesterday I, out, for the first time, out loud read a memoir by Vanda Lurie. For people, I would highly recommend you Google her and actually read her testimony. And um, it's probably one of the most harrowing ones uh, from the Vola massacre that I have read. And reading it out loud really brought it home rather than reading it, you know, when you read certain things in your head, they don't become as real. And I pretty much sat there and, and, and cried after reading it out loud. And it's basically the bottom line is she was a pregnant woman and they spared nobody. Uh, children, pregnant women, everybody, they massacred everybody, regardless of sex, they were all gone. And she was, she had her two little children in her, by her hand, and she was pregnant, uh, and she was pushed into one of these factory massacres, and her two children got, were shot uh, right in front of her, uh, and she was shot as well, quite badly wounded, but she managed to hide them under the bodies, and uh, she, there was so much blood and everything, the Germans didn't notice, and she was determined that she was going to save her baby, and so she crawled out from, the Germans went along after the massacres and shot people, anybody who moved, but she managed to crawl out and, and sneak away, hide in a little room of the factory and then, and then uh, got away. There's also YouTube footage of her being interviewed after the war where she just breaks down. She just can't, can't even finish her story. Um, and I actually know her son, um, the one who survived, you know, and she gave wow. birth a very short time after that. And he survived uh, the war and later became a chemistry teacher. But uh, it's, it's just one of many, many horrific stories. I mean, it gets to the point when I was reading them that, that they're, they're so frequent, they're so common, they're so large. After a while, my brain was becoming kind of um, uh, nulled to, you, you, it was, it was coming so thick and so fast, it was just destroying me. You know, it's just amazing, awful stuff. So Lena, um, the, the, talk about the power station and the role in the, in the battle, please, for us. So Alex briefly mentioned that uh, not all strategic points were captured. Uh, there is a positive. This one was the power yeah. station. Uh, you've got to remember the insurgents needed to power the city. It was an impor incredibly important uh, point. And I, I, quite, I find it quite interesting how they captured this. So over months, they managed to train the civilians that were working inside the power station to become insurgents themselves. And the whole idea was is that they'd, uh, they'd let a bomb go off in the, in the basement. And what they managed to do also was cut communication to the city. And when the Gestapo rang in to check, oh my God, is everything okay? One of the Polish uh, resistance basically answered back in perfect term, yeah, everything's fine, everything's good. And it just carried on. But unfortunately, this was probably one of the one points that was constantly bombed, that was constantly under attack. And they lost so many, I mean, I, I, I met one of, the, one of the insurgents that was part of this, uh, his name was Bochan, he, he passed away about four years ago, an absolute, a, absolutely amazing man. And uh, they were just constantly on the go with him, being attacked, being bombed, everything, because it was a point that would power everything to everyone. They had electricity, they could cook, they could do so much with power. And this is what it looks like now, which has uh, just been turned into a place for food and offices, uh, along with the gentrified area here, as you can see. But I've actually, I've got two more points, actually, funny enough, where I'm standing to show you as well. Please, um, please. So behind me, just going to turn around, here is a school. And it is the school for Kilibar. I was actually in there earlier today. 
and the veterans used to come to the school and talk about their experiences. But on the wall of the school, if you bear with me one moment, as I walk over, you will find many of these places all around Warsaw. This is why I love the city, because every street, every corner has some sort of history. So in this place, on the 27th of September, 1944, in the hospital for the uprising insurgents, the Germans shot 22 Poles. Uh, I've got another one of these that I know more details about that I'll show you guys later, but I just thought I'd stop here and show you what these look like around the hall. And that's a standard plaque. There are lots of them. Are that, they're all the same design, am I right? Uh, Alex, is there about, about 200 and something? 100 and something? I can't remember yes, exactly. They, and they're, all, they're almost all the same design. And then there are other monuments as well to um, uh, other, other different types of monuments. But these are as a sort of standard design uh, and then, and when you walk around Warsaw, you just get a sense of the scale of, yeah. of the number of people who were who were murdered simply in cold blood. They, this would be these would be, I mean, in this case, uh, uh, patients in hospitals, um, um, you know, people just walking down the street, people who were in their apartments, they were they were simply taken out and shot, murdered. This was all on Hitler's and Himmler's order. And would those flowers and candles have been placed there today, Alina or Alex, or what, are they there permanently? They're, they're very often refreshed. I mean, they're, they're, of course, today this is the 1st of August, so yeah. there will be, these places will be particularly well tended today, but you, you do find that you, you, you go down the street and, and there'll be a candle placed with some flowers, um, you know, next to, next to one of these markers, and you don't know who or why remembered this particular um, place. Maybe their father or mother was killed there, or grandparent, or who knows, who knows what what it what it is so they are they are very much respected and tended mm. i mean I'm, this is maybe a dumb question but there really can't be many people in warsaw who don't have some connection with it unless they've moved in for another country in recent years if you if you're from that area you must have a personal story in your family i mean surely yeah absolutely absolutely everybody because it wasn't just the, that you would have had it you know be related to competence um you know, it's just ironic but, but just the power station. Well, my husband's grandmother worked in that power station. So, right. you know, it, um, and then, and the same thing is, is, is true because even if you were just an ordinary civilian, a kid, five years old, uh, you would have been forced to leave Warsaw at the end of the uprising. You, yeah. they, the whole city was totally emptied. So everybody was affected by it one way or another. So, so there's nobody who, who, who lived through it that wouldn't have been terribly affected in one, in one sense. And, you know, again, for those watching, this is the whole, what we're trying to do at World War II TV is bring you these locations live on the day. Sure, the camera footage is a bit jerky. Alina hasn't got a stabilizer, but, you know, she knows her subject. I've got two absolutely amazing historians on there. This is 76 years ago today, these events began. And to be able to bring you live images is just, is just absolutely, truly wonderful. And I can't thank both of you enough for coming and doing this. And uh, I'm I'm going to learn a lot about this subject because I, you know, I've, I've done a lot of reading the last few days, sure I have, but it's just absolutely incredible. And the, the scale of it is just mind blowing. So where are you off to now, Alina? Yeah. I'm taking you all down by the river. It sounds like something nice, but it's not really that nice. No, I'm, um, getting, I'm getting the impression there's not much nice that comes out of this battle. Um, no. Yeah, there's not no, many it's... moments of, um, you know, hum hu um, humanity uh in fact the opposite of humanity this the, you know the murdering is the only thing that the battle i'm thinking of is the is the manila in the philippines which sort of had that similar scale of the civilians being just just wiped out in their in their thousands but the, you know this is just brutality on an unrivaled level so um but looking beautiful today i have to say i mean i've never been to war so it's looking from what we're seeing it looks a pretty nice city to be to be in um and obviously you've been there a number of years alex so you might you like living in poland so um, no, I, I, I first started coming here in 1986 and, uh, and, and have been traveling back and forth and living here for many, many years. And uh, I just watched the city change and transform um, and grow. And uh, it is a lovely, lovely place to live. It's a fantastic atmosphere. Um, and, uh, and yet I think that there is something very special about it because of its experiences in the war. I mean, there's a, um, a, a real understanding of, of freedom, I think. And that's that's the, the, the bottom line, I would say, is that yeah. Having been under the Nazis and under the uh, uh, Soviets, um, there's a real sense of gratitude at the fact that it's it's now politically uh, free of dictatorships and 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 war.
but so much of that that freedom that was was gained in the 80s must you know, that a lot of the spirit from that must have come from this spirit 40 years earlier i mean with, without the uprising in 44 is it fair to say that the the movement that brought freedom wouldn't have happened 40 years later but there was a there was a sense of finally getting what we tried earlier well i think that i think they're certainly related i mean the what ifs of history i i don't know but there's certainly a a sense that the um, the, I mean, even the creation of the underground during the war and how dangerous it was for, for people to, uh, to actually work and, and in these conditions under the, under the noses of the SS and the Gestapo. You know, you were arrested and, and shot if you, if you were caught in a, a, a university class that was illegal. I mean, all of these things that they did was, was just incredible. And so in a way, I think it was also a, a, a practice run for the solidarity movement, for martial law. Mm. Uh, the Poles just won't put up with not being allowed to be free and they and they will find a way. Uh, and and it, I think it also sent a, a message to Stalin that you know you can you, the, the uprising um, was so dramatic and traumatic. Um, but Stalin, even Stalin couldn't be guaranteed that the Poles wouldn't do something like this again because they have a history of it. So yeah. I think that in that sense that the uprising did have a, a very much a spiritual um, historical emphasis onto what happened in the 1980s as well. And there's, there's just no question that, that the Poles uh, were enormously important in the evolution of, of solidarity and, and the um, end of the communist system in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And it's, it, the resistance always has, is affected by how the regime was. We did a show on Denmark in World War II a few days ago, and the Germans are pretty well behaved there in Denmark. They let them even listen to the BBC radio, things like that. And so although there was a resistance, they've been treated more on an intellectual equal, equal earlier, whereas Poland, of course, were treated, you know, so terribly. So that as you look at Europe, you see how different each country was being played against each other by not just the Germans, but the Russians as well. And indeed, I guess the British and Canadians are getting involved with how we view these countries and what we think is going to happen there and how they're going to react to situations. But yeah, amazing That's stuff. Neat. Yeah, and you mentioned this earlier that, that you know, the brutality uh, that the Germans meted out to the Poles and, and then uh, Belarusians, Ukrainians, and Soviets is, is, was just off the charts in terms of brutality because this was a war of a racially motivated yeah. war by Hitler yeah. to get what, what was Lebensraum. And he just thought that the people who lived in these cities and towns and, and, and areas were non human or under humans. They weren't, that they weren't like the great Aryans. And that's the problem. Yeah. So they went into the West treating the Norwegians and the Danes like kind of sort of mini Germans, but, yeah. um, but, the, but the Eastern populations, Jews and Poles, Ukrainians, Belarusians were treated with the absolute amount of brutality, of course, culminating in the Holocaust, but, but the populations generally were treated like just subhuman creatures. Well, you know, the way we've talked about other shows, you know, that I have this British, you know, British, the British idea of, you know, when we were escaping from prisoner of war camps, it was almost like getting one over matron and boarding school that, you know, you were captured again and locked up again. We grew up without much of the sense of just the reprisals if we hadn't been British. Well, obviously, I'll, I'll interrupt myself there because we've got something there to look at. Alina, what have we, what have we got there? So here we have one that's like this running past me. It's fine. Please don't excite me. Um, but at least one ducked. Um, <laughs> sorry. So in front of us we have the power station, the people that perish uh, in memory of 280 workers who worked at the power station and who died in uh, various circumstances from executions, public executions, all went to the and then on the one below is one uh, perished during the Warsaw Uprising. And right. if anybody's interested, that's uh, Street Pampal. Street, yeah. Yeah, with the Polish eagle on the top. And then um, quite a few of these will have a Polish flag, not one of them. And then obviously, the uh, we've got a bit, of, um, bit of wind interference now, but it's okay. The, yeah, uh, sorry. You see the Polish, uh, the flowers with the, there's a red P and a, and an anchor made out of flowers. And that's the symbol of the uprising. It, it stands for fighting uh, Poland. And it's, uh, it's uh, even during the uprising the um, and during the occupation, Poles would write that as graffiti on the walls and this kind of thing. It was a, a very much a sort of symbol of, of underground Polish 
the and fight. You see on the helmets as well. Didn't they mark you on the yes. helmets? They captured. Yeah, marked it on the helmets, on, yeah. on armbands, uh, and and as I said, graffiti. Any anywhere they could put the symbol without getting caught by the Germans, they did it. And and, uh, and it was a very very important symbol for Warsaw. It was maybe, uh, maybe a dumb question again, folks. But um, you know, because I'm I'm living in France, where there was the communist resistance and the FFE and the, and the Mackey, and there's lots of different political movements behind the motivations. This was this this uprising was much more um, one a one focus. It was all organised. Uh, am I right? Very much so. Very much so. There were there were small a few small very small other groups like there was a sort of the socialist the communist group and, and a few others um, Armia Ludova which was of course after the war the the Soviets only talked about them but they were a tiny percentage. Generally yeah. speaking, the the poles galvanized around. Uh, the Aka, um, really from the very beginning, there were a number of different groups that they sort of melded into the Aka, and it really was a national movement. It was understood by everybody that this was, you know, we are going to fight for our freedom. And uh, it was, it was, it was partly because the Germans came in, as we talked about already, with such brutality that there was not any question of collaboration. Of course, there are always collaborators of some kind or other yeah. in war. That's just that. But as a, as a nation, generally speaking. The, uh, the the poles, you know, there were no SS Galicia Polish divisions. There were no um, SS Gestapo. You know, the, all these sorts of things that happened in France, that happened in yeah. in the Baltic states. They simply didn't happen in Poland. Partly, as you said, as you said earlier, because of the sheer brutality uh, and and the, the the way that the Germans came in and and suppressed the population. And there's also a fact that there was a, a quite a substantial German minority in Poland who the Nazis did get to collaborate with them. So they had people on the ground who they could, who could, they could use to help, help them control the population. So it was a very complex situation, but generally speaking, the AK really did stand for the Polish nation, which is why the Poles felt so betrayed later on when the Western allies recognized Soviet, uh, the Soviet puppet regime instead of the AK who was headquartered in exile in London. Yeah, no, that's that's the very sad chapter. So, um, is that is that the church, Alina? Yes, it is. But uh, just before I touch on this church, I have to throw her name in because she is one of my heroes. Um, Alex mentioned about the resistance symbol. The the person who created this resistance symbol is Anna Smolenska, and she was actually arrested in Warsaw with her sister, sister-in-law, her mother, um, and her father was also arrested. But she actually created that symbol in a competition and it became the symbol for, for freedom, basically. But um, the story is not going to end well. Basically, she lasts about three months. Uh, they all perish in Auschwitz, except for her father, who ends up getting shot in the ruins of Paviak prison or the former ghetto at the time, in, uh, just after the up uprising happened. And the one person that survives is her brother. And the reason they were all arrested was because her brother was caught. So I don't know how you want to take that story, but it is, it's heartbreaking. And she's, she was an incredibly beautiful woman who was a liaison and she did so much for the resistance. Well, thank you for that. So that brings um, another, another really important point um, that, that um, we tend to think about some militaries, always male and the, the guys in uniform, but there was tremendous participation by the women of Poland, the women of Warsaw, uh, in the in in the fighting as well as as many many other things they would as as uh, Alina just said liaison um, um, intelligence work uh, my mother in in law was a sapper you know worked in in the Kedif um, elite sapper unit uh, for women um, so there were, the, their their participation was extraordinary uh, and of course this was very good because they could move around the city they could they could do an awful lot. Um, and sort of under the noses of the Germans for a short time, and then the Germans cottoned on, and they treated the women with just e equal brutality. The Gestapo was was equally brutal and horrific to to women as as to the men that they captured. Well, I think it's fair to say the treatment of women in Poland had been pretty shit for the previous four years, anyway. So, can I, yeah. um, and and by the Russians earlier as well. So, I mean, it's not like you were treated with any kind of dignity. So, you might as well pick up a rifle and fight. I might as well do something anyway because. Um, yeah, so yeah. The, the, bring us back to the church, Lynn. What was this? That, that's St. Teresa's Saint, uh, Saint church, yes? It is. This is St. Teresa's church. If anybody has the opportunity to go in, I mean, I, I could probably go in if you guys want me to. Well, 
Yeah, are you allowed to film in charge? I've just showed the photo you sent me there at the end of the battle there. So you can see it was one of those buildings that Shell was still there, but very, yes. very badly damaged. There's um, plaques up in the, in the courtyard of the church that commemorate a lot of the men that were lost, including the priest for the battalion, which I am going to talk about at the end. Yeah. So I'm not going to talk about him now because his story is incredible. But this was the church, basically, it was bombed out. And this is what Povisho looked like. Um, but I just want to, want to, Alex brought up the women. I think I think we should carry on on the subject, to be honest. Oh, please, yeah, go for it. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. it's a subject that both Alex and I are incredibly passionate about, but women, even to today, you know, they're kind of partially dismissed, these women. But you've got to remember, they were some of the bravest human beings ever. They did the hardest part of the work. But some of them may have not fought with a gun. OK, but to me, I still classify them as soldiers at the end of the day. They weren't just women, they were soldiers of the home army. Mm. And um, I have uh, one of my favourite soldiers, um, and Alex is probably going to agree with me on this one, is uh, Maria Tsetis, so pseudonym chimpanz, so chimpanzee in English. And she basically got wounded. She fought with a, with a gun in her hand. She got wounded, uh, had her hand amputated and ended up, she got frustrated, left the hospital, went to find her unit. On the way to finding her unit, she was stopped by a German patrol who asked her, are you a bandit? And she replied, yes, I am a soldier of the home army. So they shot mm -hmm. her. Exactly. That's it. It's exactly the, the, it shows the spirit also of the, of the combatants, you know, and we were talking, you were talking a little bit earlier about the, um, about the sort of conduct of, of the Germans and, and, and the Poles. But I have to say that the Poles um, under Borg Komorowski very, very deliberately uh, de were determined to uh, fight this uh, war uh, under the rules of the Geneva Convention in complete contrast to what the Germans were doing. Uh, and, and so they, they, were, they were very conscious to take prisoners of war. There were very many examples, for example, of, of Germans in hospitals being taken care of by uh, Polish doctors. And, and Derlewanger would burst in and you know, start shooting everybody. And the Germans would be begging for the lives of the, of the doctors and nurses. The Derlewanger and the others um, made, a, made a practice of, of killing everybody in hospitals, including the, the medical staff, um, in, including some very famous uh, doctors and professors, for example, who, who taught in Paris or whatever else. Um, they just they just killed them all. Uh, and but there were cases of Germans begging for the lives of the of the Polish doctors who'd saved them. And 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 so so there is a there there was a sense of honor and a code of honor and code of conduct uh, in the in the Warsaw Uprising on the side of the Poles, deliberately done so that there would never be after the war uh, the accusation, oh well, you were yeah. just bandit and and, and uh, you know you treated the Germans just as badly as they treated you, so we don't have any sympathy for you. Uh, so it was very much a conscious decision. But the women were very much part of this, and and. Um, you know, as Alina said, they, they were, in many cases, did by far the most dangerous uh, jobs. My, my father-in-law always talked about, for example, they were the liaison, um, uh, see, um, kind of secret service liaison uh, between uh, all these different units and, and the commanders and commanding officers and so on. They, they were the ones because they got um, news around by messenger. So they had the safe houses. They had to open the door, not knowing who was on the other side of it. They had to send these messages and so on. My father-in-law was in Auschwitz, and when he was released from Auschwitz, he, his friend, uh, who was quite high up in the Akal, even though she was just a teenager by this point, uh, took down his testimony from, from, from Auschwitz. It was the first official testimony for, from inside the camp. Wow. And then, um, and then she was caught shortly afterwards with some microfilm that was going to be taken by courier to London. There were these famous couriers like Jan Korski who took, uh, went across Germany with with these with this contraband, and uh, she was discovered and um, and taken to Gestapo headquarters. And then by this point, my father-in-law was working as a liaison to Paviak prison, and witnesses from Paviak saw her come back after being interrogated by the Gestapo, and they said the lower half of her body was literally in ribbons. She couldn't stand up when she and her whole family were executed, um, but she couldn't stand because her, she'd been tortured so badly. And this is the sort of thing that, that these brave, brave young women um, went through at the hands of the Gestapo and the SS and the others. Well, and, and just to make a point for those watching, we were not in any way trying to attempt to explain the entire 63-day battle, zone by zone, recapture of sectors. 
that it's too much to tackle in this show. What we're going to try and do is bring you exactly what we're doing now is just give you a, a, tr a taster of, of the brutality, some of the heroic stories, just whet your appetite to learn more. Of course, Alex's book, the link is, is in, the, in the description below and Alina's working on various projects. Alina's working on the first convoy of prisoners to Auschwitz. So, so um, it's just to get across some of the, the, the humanity. And yet the fact you, you emphasized about the, 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 uh, the Poles insisting on looking after German prisoners is goes back to an initial comment about how well organized they were, because you do see in other countries, there's no, the, the, the higher ups aren't able to coordinate and control these resistance units below them. They just go about on their almost like gangs of you know, pirates below doing whatever they want to do. It seems this is very, very organized. And there, there's yeah. clear messages that we are doing it this way because this is the right way to do it. So we'll be treated with the, the respect we are as, as combatants, not, um, not um, guerrillas, if you like. Um, exactly, and that's a very important point because um, the, the conduct was, it, it was tremendously influential because later on in the uprising, because of the, the conduct, um, uh, Himmler and Goebbels and others started to say, oh my goodness, you know, if we can get the, um, the Germans to fight against the Soviets as they move into Germany, uh, the way the Poles have fought in Warsaw, you know, we, we have a chance of actually keeping them at bay. And wow. this was the, was the creation of the, the Volkssturm, which is where wow, the Germans yeah, yeah. arm bands on, um, on, you know, old guys and young kids and stuck them out in front of tanks with a Panzerfaust or whatever. But, but, the, but the origins were this tremendous uh, togetherness and, and, and actually, I mean, it wasn't successful as an uprising, but no. certainly the cohesiveness that you're talking about was very successful. And it just showed that if a, if a city wants to fight and they've got the spirit and the will and desire to do it, they can keep, you know, keep a big army at, at bay for quite yeah. a long time. And again, of course, this is also to do with urban warfare and, 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 and you know, you can have one, one sniper on a, on a roof and can keep a whole unit at bay for a while, you know, this kind of thing. It's the nature of that kind of warfare. But it was, but it was very interesting that the Poles created this underground state and this underground army under the noses of the Germans, which, as you said, was highly disciplined, highly organized. Uh, before, during, and after the, the uprising and the war indeed, you know, people, my father-in-law knew everybody who was in this unit after the war. They, there was nobody who could say, oh, well, I was in this and I, I fought there, whatever. Everybody, everybody would know because yeah. you had a rank, you had, you were, it was a professional army. And they were uh, fight, fighting very much when they were negotiating with Erich von den bach -Zileski, that the AK would be treated as prisoners of war. And they were, and they were sent to a prisoner of war camps and therefore were treated uh, much better than in fact the civilians who were taken uh, taken off to this Durchlager called Pruschkov and they were um, about 50,000 of them were sent to camps including Auschwitz and Dachau mm. and Ravensbrück and about 100,000 of them were sent as slave labor in, in the Reich. So they were wow. the last sort of big pool of slave, slave labor that people like Albert Speer uh, and the TOT uh, oper operation organization TOT were able to use in, in Germany. So the, this, the, the, the way the conduct of the, of the AK, AK um, underground army did lead in the end to them being treated as combatants. Wow. So Alina, we're at the bridge now. Um, explain just what before the bridge. There. Literally just before the bridge. I have two anecdotes to throw in here for you. Please. Yeah. Uh, would you like the crazy one first or the sad one first? You do with crazy first, sad second. Yeah, sure. Crazy first. Okay, so in front of me, you can see the hospital. And within the first few days, the Germans basically, it was a German hospital, they evacuated the hospital. And I'm going to say this very bluntly, my insane grandfather and his insane platoon leader decided to storm this hospital by themselves uh, to basically see who or what was left inside. They encountered half a dozen of Ukrainian SS that were basically liquidated. Um, so the insanity of my grandfather, ladies and gentlemen, in this hospital. It's not like he passed it on to you, though, is it? He said, <laughs> he said oh. in a <clears throat> kind of way. Uh, I think he did. Is it, really is, it, is, it, is, it, is it the right time to show the photo of your grandfather? Let's bring up the, the, the photo for those watching. So Alina's grandfather, third from left there. Is that right? Oh, yes, third from left. Um, and and the some gentleman, devil there in the middle. The, the one right in the middle, that is the platoon leader, uh, Rafał Olbromski, uh, Jan Kukulicki, an incredibly handsome brave accomplished soldier and uh, we're going to talk about his death in just a moment but yeah. uh, um, well if you want to keep that photo up there 
so slightly to the right hand side of me is a street which is red cross and if everybody's looking at the photo the one second to the left uh, that is my grandfather's best friend, uh, Yusuf Chichinsky, uh, pseudonym Nawent. I'm just going to really briefly go over this. So they trained together during the occupation, and in the end, they ended up training soldiers together themselves. So these two men would go on missions together. They pr pretty much did everything together. They were like brothers. And those of you who have served will know what that's like. And on the 31st of August, 1944, he was on a mission on this street and his soldiers basically said to him, do not leave, there is a sniper on the roof. And unfortunately, I've never found out what the reason was, but he, as they say in Polish, he was searching for death. They're not quite sure why a mission went wrong and that's about as far as, and, and all the information that I do know, he basically left and he got shot by the sniper. Um, my grandfather wasn't, obviously too happy and he actually ended up finding the sniper and getting rid of him so yeah. and every time I spoke to my grandfather about now and uh, Yusuf Chichinsky you could feel the pain in his heart and how much it truly hurt him losing such an amazing human in his life so mm. and for those watching if, if it had if if this show had been last year you probably would have brought your grandfather on the show somehow, wouldn't you? But alas, he passed away, didn't he, earlier in the year? Uh, he passed away two months ago. Uh, I would have flown to America and brought him on the show for you, ladies and gentlemen, because he was a remarkable human being. You're a remarkable uh, human being too, Alina. We love you. Thank you. It's, it's interesting to just take a quick look at that photograph and look at the uniforms, because, of course, under the occupation, the Poles were not allowed to have any kind of Polish army uniform, of course. And so what happened was that uh, they had to coddle together whatever they could. Um, and, and you notice here is just to come back to the markings that they, are, they have red and white armbands. You can't see the color, obviously. Uh, red and white armbands and markings uh, on their lapels, some of them. And uh, some of these um, uniforms are, are um, actually called panterki. They, they were taken from a, a storage warehouse in Stavki Street which was a storage warehouse for all the SS, um, SS uh, uniforms. And so they actually were wearing some of them, uh, German uniforms, but then they put the armbands and the markings clearly visible so that they would be treated not as banditen as the Germans mm -hmm. wanted to call them bandits, but treated as uh, soldiers who were, who were um, dressed under the regulations of, of the Geneva Convention. And the Can combination I throw something of German in there? gear and Russian gear, and then later when they get drops from the Allies, they would have had a certain amount of uh, British and Canadian yeah. weapons as well. So it was a real mixed bag of uh, a bit, bit of everything. Anything they could get. If you throw that photo back up, just to add, just one thing that's very specific, because this is uh, the unit, the Falcon unit. And I don't know, Paul, if you can zoom in onto the soldier on the right, far right hand side a little bit. Um, there is a triangle. On his on his shoulder. Yeah, both of them. Yep. yep. So everybody in that unit had, uh, and funny enough, we can see Lusha there. I want to talk about her later. She is she is definitely one of my heroes. Uh, on that, uh, so it's like a triangle. It's actually the German mine flags. Yeah. And what this what the Rafalki did is they collected them and they put a big R underneath. So it defined yeah, them. See that? Yeah. 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 So if anybody wants to Google it, you can see the yellow triangle with the mine sign and an R, and that's how they defined themselves. And they were the only platoon that had that in the Warsaw Uprising. So if you ever wow. come across photographs with anything like that, you know that's the platoon. Wow. I've seen those, those mine flags often for sale at military affairs. So wow, the, the fact they were reused by the, your, your grandfather's platoon, amazing stuff. So wow. Wonderful. I'm, I mean, I mean, it's hard to say I'm enjoying the show because I'm not enjoying the tragedy, but I'm, I'm enjoying the fact we're bringing this information to the audience. So thank you very much. You two wonderful stuff. So where are we you heading now, Alina? Ask me about the bridge. You know you want to. I, I, I was waiting for you to do it, Alina. Go on. Tell us about the bridge, <laughs> Alina. Tell us about the bridge. I, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to touch on this. I'm going to let Alex carry on with, uh, with the story for the rest of Warsaw. But this very specific bridge in front of us, it was a very dangerous, dangerous bridge. And uh, for those who don't know what is possible, 
they would have a panzer train on this bridge. I think Paul has a photograph. Of, oh, and then we've got a train going past. So what the panzer train would do, it would basically drive up and down this bridge and shoot down anybody that tried to cross over here in the freeway either side. And hundreds of people would be mowed down. It was terrifying. Everybody I've spoken to was just incredibly scared to cross here. And if they were lucky, they could. And if they were unlucky, they would lose their life. So this was just one of many. Yeah, this is a photo of Panzer Zug 75, the, the, the very train. And there's another photo Alina sent me, which I will bring up of the bridge. Where's it gone? There we go. And here is that same bridge um, that, that Alina was looking at there. And um, this is, I'll ask Alex in a minute, this is the weight of power the Germans can bring in that the poor Poles can only hope for. Armoured trains is, is, a, is an arm that, that they, you know, you, what can you do against that? And the big heavy barreled mortars that are uh, flying in, uh, sending in shells and stukas. Uh, this is where the, uh, the, the, the lack of equipment the Poles have is going to really come telling, isn't it? When you've got trains like that moving through the city, at, 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 well, at what speed would they travel through? I mean, so, so, yeah, you can't stop them. I mean, there's nothing you as a Pole can do about that, is there really? Nothing. And that's, it's very interesting because we, we've, we've gotten to the, the, the Vola district and the Vola massacre. And as you said, we're not going to go through district by district, but, but the train is, a, it, it makes the point that I was trying to make earlier that what happens is that the, the Poles take over large sections of districts, but they don't have the communication lines. They don't mm. have the rail. They don't have the big streets uh, and, and so on. And so this was not the only Panzer train that was going around this, this particular district. There was another one up wow. um, toward Jolly Borsch and the, and the uh, old new town. So that section was divided and they just shot, you know, shot into the old town, into the new town, into, into, into people. Um, so the, 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 the point about the uprisings, the Germans take each district, district by district. And the geography of these are very, very different. So Vola is, you know, fairly sparsely populated by comparison. Uh, and uh, and it was, it, you could use tanks, you could use some of this heavy, heavy, heavy equipment. But then the next big section that they tried to get was the place in the center of town called the Old Town. And it is the Old Town of Warsaw. It's walled, it's very, very densely packed in buildings. It's, 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 it dates back to the Middle Ages, heavy, heavy walls. Um, uh, the building's very thick stone, tiny little uh, narrow alleyways, and the, um, the Aka created basically a kind of fortress out of it. Um, and Hitler was furious because he, even, he, even throwing the Derlewanger Brigade against this, they could not get in. And so this is when uh, Hitler changes his tactic. And instead of just having Derlewanger and some tanks, he starts um, the, with the bombing, the, the old town, the Luftwaffe come in, start at eight in the morning, bomb till lunchtime, take a lunch break for an hour, and then uh, start resume from one o'clock to five o'clock every day, um, bombing the, 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 the city. Then he brings in uh, so-called Krova, the uh, multiple launchers. He brings in the Karl Mortar, which is the largest moving um, uh, weapon ever created by human beings, these gigantic shells. Uh, that blow up the, the, the city walls and, and so on. Um, and and uh, the, so the amount of men and material that he's, he's pushing on this, on this uh, city is mind boggling. And of course, what you have in the, in the old town is not only uh, can the Germans not get in, but the people can't get out. And, and mm -hmm. so, and it's being mercilessly bombed. The buildings just be pounded to rubble. So people go underground, they're living, they're cellars uh, that are attached to one another by tunnels. People just simply live underground and, and they're mercilessly bombed. And what happens is that a big attack will happen in one part of the town. So everybody will go underground to the other part. And then that part will be bombed. It was absolutely dreadful. There was a shortage of food, shortage of water. Um, and and the, um, the Germans were using incendiary bombs. They were using uh, all, just every type of weapon they could think of. Uh, and so it was an absolutely dreadful siege. When the Poles realize at the end that they are going to be, they're going to lose the old town, uh, they do something which is also very important to the history of the uprising, which is they use the sewers and they get out the, the uh, soldiers, the combatants get out uh, of the old town by crawling through the, through the sewers, which is, of course, very unpleasant and very difficult to do. But they've mapped out the sewers and the Germans don't go down into the sewers because they're terrified of, of them. So, so this is, a, this is a, the, the siege of the old town. Once the old town falls, uh, 
um, the other districts are taken relatively quickly, including Povishla, where, um, where we're seeing the pictures now. And this, this, this Suez story, I mean, I watched Canal a couple of days ago just to get my mind into the mindset of this. And this, this again, it starts off quite um, improvised and it rapidly becomes highly organized with like one way routes, isn't it? For messages and couriers and things. And, and even some of the commanding that officers is. are using these tunnels for, and sewage tunnels for, for, for communication. But everything I read is just horrific. I mean, we all know, we don't need to explain what a sewer, a sewer system consists of, but they're literally crawling through crap. Um, yeah, and, all, and all, but it became organized. They they organized. They def they had barricades around the entrances, didn't they? They defended it uh, to, to at all yeah. costs. And, and but yeah, and this becomes, of course, it became controversial for the civilians who were stuck in the old town because they wanted to get out too. Uh, and the Aka refused. They, as you said, they were cordons, and they wouldn't let this the, most of the civilians out. Uh, and so this caused a lot of resentment between by the end of the uprising mm. between the uh, civilians and the uh, Aka to some extent. Uh, but it was a tremendous story. And um, and the and the one other thing to mention is, is that the the August September in that year was pr very very hot, extremely hot and dry. And it's one of the reasons the sewers sewer levels were down enough that people could actually be right. still sludgy it was terrible um but there were uh some again women young women who who mapped out and learned the the whole system and they had timetables and they had so street signs under underground and they had there were there were manholes that were dangerous because the germans would drop grenades through every once in a while if they heard any noise that they you know they, they so that was, was tremendously dangerous work again largely done by by young slight small women mm. And again, I think, you know, it's, we ought to emphasize as well that as they gradually lose districts, they lose things like the water amenities, they lose power. So as it get, the struggle goes on, even the risk of infection, if you have a minor injury, to, you know, you've been caught by a bit of shrapnel from an explosion, you go down, you crawl through the, the kind of conditions they're in a sewage, that's going to get infected. There's no bandages, there's no medical facilities, there's not enough water, there's not enough to eat. Everything is big around you is becoming worse and worse as these, these the, the two months passed. So, I mean, I can only imagine how horrific it was it, 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 to have to be moved through sewers, the sewage system. So, Alina, you're showing us that building. I'm, I'm sensing you want to talk about it. I do, I do. I've actually got a few things on this street to talk about. Go for it. First one, uh, this is the teacher building, uh, the one in front of me here. You've got a photograph. A I've soldier got two, standing, yeah. Soldier standing in a row, if we could have that one first. We'll do that one, yeah. And that is exactly where you're all looking at right now. Uh, the men standing along. Uh, if you see the gentleman in the white helmet, uh, it's a bit difficult to see. He's about 10 to the this right. One, yeah. That one. Yep, yeah, that's my grandfather. Nice. That's all of them standing there. And this was basically their headquarters. And this is also the same building where Rafael, his platoon leader, loses his life on the 24th of August 1944. He's firing piets down to the other side where the river Viswa or Vistula is and it ricochets and basically explodes killing him and apparently from reports he lasted about an hour before he died and it gave the chance for his uh, fiance to come and say goodbye she was a nurse but wow. in a different platoon and also I wanted to bring up Lucia and if Lucia's daughter have I got a photo of the grave yes. in the street Oh, that's, you, well, that's you do, the actually. same building there. I'll bring that grave up, but then I'm, I'm trying to follow your lead, Alina. I've got it here somewhere where... No, that's fine. I can cross over. Hold on. Bear there with we me go. Now. And we, people love... There's a comments coming on YouTube. People are loving your camera work, Lena. They're loving Alex's comments. They're, they're loving it all, really. I mean, loving Thank is you. a bad word to use about something so um, so awful, but they're, they're loving what we're doing it to bring the story. So that... That's just great. So that, that's the grave there, is an improvised grave in the street. And I'm just going to stand roughly where it is. Right. I'll stop sharing the photo in a second then. That's fine. So that's Jan Kotolitsky's grave there. He was buried in the street. I know Alex and I are going to move uh, to a slightly different comment just to follow on from that. But that's roughly on standing where you could see the barricade. Wow. And this is exactly what we're trying to do, folks, bring you these exact locations with the, with the best stories given by the best historians. So amazing stuff. So, um, and there's a plaque there. There's that same photo. Oh, there we are. Exactly the same photo right there. 
ladies and yeah, gentlemen. Another comment saying, yes, what we're doing is great. So you've got a big fan club, you two. I mean, I'm just, I'm not doing much. I'm holding it together today, but I'm not doing, I'm not contributing very much, but I'm, I'm learning so much. So yeah, Alex, do you want to come in and talk about these events a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned the, um, the, 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 this very moving picture of the grave and, and, you know, what's it doing in the middle of the street. But the fact was that, you know, by the end of the you know, uprising, you have about 150,000 civilians who've been killed and about 14, 15,000 uh, Aka soldiers and, um, and the problem was there was nowhere to bury them. And as you said, as the city, as the area that was um, held by the poles got smaller and smaller, not only did you lose water and electricity and everything else, but you also lost space and you, there was simply nowhere to bury people. So you had all sorts of little, little tiny allotments and gardens and parks and, and sidewalks and, and, and you know, pretty well anywhere that you could actually dig. You, this, this became a, a, a grave, a cemetery. So it was really, really... Um, horrific because it kind of gives a mental picture of how mm. horrific it, this experience was for people. Well that's you know, all, all we could ever intend to do with this show was just highlight some of the, the small the small stories that are actually incredibly moving human stories and, and as I get people interested in the subject so uh, where are we off to now Alina? We're actually not moving I'm going to okay. move to the right hand side so there are not very many places you can physically touch and feel and just see the actual devastation in Warsaw because as you all very well know most of it's been rebuilt yeah but on the street so street Smolikovskiego where I'm standing right now so it's about halfway down the street you have this wall here and on this wall here you can see the shrapnel and the bullet oh, yeah. bullet holes and this is the only remaining bullet holes on this side they used to be on the other side but unfortunately, um, Warsaw decided to renovate the buildings. Mm. Well, it's something with World War II TV tradition to show bullet holes or spang, as we call it, spang holes. I don't know where we, whether we invented that or not, but we, we, we call one of our Twitter tags is three old men looking for spang. So there's some spang there in Warsaw. It's, uh, and this is that re reminder, folks, that we are actually looking at these the places these things happened, and uh, it's always poignant seeing seeing bullet holes. It reminds you this is these aren't movie sets. This is real history that tr terribly people tragically killed in these areas. So thank you very much for bringing us this stuff. And um, you mentioned the rebuilding. Uh, it, it, I mean, with such destruction that they they couldn't really have saved much of the history because there was not enough to save, was it? So you have to just uh, deal, deal with the monuments and plaques and things. There's not much to see physically from the city. Well, one of the things that, that, um, that's really terrible about the uprising was that, that um, the, the, you, you can ask the question, well, did anybody help? Did anybody in the rest of the world really care about it? Um, and uh, the, the answer is that Churchill did very much and he tried to, he tried to help, he tried to get airdrops organized uh, and in fact, there were some, um, uh, you know, we, we, about 360 airmen were actually killed trying to get supplies to Warsaw. So it's not as if nothing was done. However, um, the big problem was that uh, Stalin refused to help. He, he considered the, he called the uprising, you know, a bunch of bandits had, had uh, um, done a criminal sort of criminal adventure and he refused to do anything to help. So when Churchill and to some extent Roosevelt begged him to allow um, the, the, um, uh, pilots to fly and land uh, behind Soviet lines so that they could refuel, Stalin refused. Um, and, and of course, there was no, no Soviet air uh, involvement over Warsaw either. So basically, the, that side of the river went dead. So Stalin moved up to the um, east part of Warsaw, a, a district called Praga, and then sat on the riverbank for the rest of the uprising and watched as the Germans uh, basically destroyed uh, the rest of the, uh, the fighters. And as the Germans took every single individual they could find, they either killed them or they sent them to this transit camp called Pruszko. So the city was gradually being emptied as the Germans captured Warsaw district by district by district by district. And uh, the district we're actually in now is one of the last ones to, to, be, to be captured. Um, yeah. And that so that's, brings into mind you know, what happened um, with the rest of the world looking, looking on. And then what Hitler does when the capitulation finally happens at the beginning of October, uh, far from leaving the city or, or letting it be, or the, the few people who are, you know, about 40,000 people still estimated, still hiding in the ruins, 
uh, many of them Jews or Aka soldiers who were too injured to leave. And of course, were, were in desperate danger because if the Germans found uh, soldiers, they, they tended to shoot them. Um, and they were killing every single Jew they could find. They, they, no, none were spared. If they were found, they were, they were simply uh, executed. Um, and so uh, the tragedy was that Hitler then gave the order to destroy Warsaw. So uh, about 35% of the destruction of the city of Warsaw happens after the end of the uprising. So between October mm -hmm. and the 17th of January, Hitler sends in special sappers and, and uh, engineers and so on, and building by building, street by street is, is blown up. And that uh, was preceded by a massive scale looting with train loads and train loads and train loads of artworks and materials and, and bedding and, and furniture and, and you name it, they, they took it. I mean, uh, Frau Himmler got uh, a two violins and an accordion. Um, and, uh, Rec took uh, whole cases of, of um, evening gowns and, and tuxedos. Wow. Uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the money, the gold bars and so on were taken from the, from the banks. I mean, the, the scale of looting of Warsaw was, mm. was one thing. And then when there was nothing left to steal, uh, the city was destroyed building by building. And that's the reason, the main reason that uh, so little is left. And of course, at the same time, you had the tragic discovery of uh, the people who were in hiding. So uh, you know, the, the most famous uh, story that, that's come down to us is of Vladislav Spielmann, who, uh, who's, who, whose wife and son are great friends of mine. She, she sadly just died a, a few weeks ago, but um, he, of the pianist fame. And he yeah. managed to hide by just sort of moving around the ruins of Warsaw. And he was in the end saved by a German officer who, who, who helped him. Otherwise he probably would have died as well. But the, uh, but the, the majority of people who were hiding uh, were discovered as these buildings were blown up systematically. And of course, when they were discovered, they were also murdered. I mean, the tragedy is just kings seem to pile up on each other one after other over the whole of this saga. And uh, there's comments coming on YouTube, which I'm checking. And of course it has to be said that despite the bravery of the RAF crews and Polish crews, and because there were Polish crews with the RAF, of course, and other uh, uh, suppliers coming in, very, very few of it actually arrived in the hands of the people who needed it. It, it either missed completely or it was broken on landing or the Germans got it. So the one tragedy of the loss of air crews led to the tragedy of not even getting the supplies anyway. So it, it's just tragedy Absolutely. after tragedy. And the most notorious of those was there was, Stalin did allow the Americans, there was an operation called Operation Frantic, the Americans had three air bases in Ukraine, and the most the most important one was at Poltava. Uh, yeah. And Stalin was allowing the, them to drop to a bomb uh, Hungary and um, Romania and Gdynia, for example. But he refused to give permission for a drop on Warsaw. But then finally, in mid September, he said, "Well, okay." But by this time, the Germans controlled really the vast majority of the city again. So the, this big, huge airdrop uh, came over, um, you know, with, with all this equipment and food and, and so on, but it almost all went into the hands of the Germans. And yeah. I remember um, reading memoirs of these German soldiers who got, you know, Hershey chocolate bars and, and, and uh, Oscar Mayer wieners for the first time because they, because the, you know, this huge drops of American goods came over. Um, but of course it, it, it was far too late for the Poles. Yeah. And there's some comments coming on YouTube about those very points about the airfields in, in the Ukrainian airfields and what have you. And should we just briefly um, kind of bring up the myth of the fact the first Polish parachute brigade were, were, were going to be jumping in because that they had been formed initially as a brigade with the idea possibly of being used to, to, to in Warsaw. But there was never really a realistic idea of actually jumping in Polish paratroopers, was there? No, there wasn't. I mean, uh, the, the, the Poles themselves wanted to, of course, but, yeah. um, but Sosobolski uh, realized that, that this just simply wasn't going to happen, wasn't going to be on the cards. And, and, uh, um, and so, it, you know, it, it, it was a sort of kind of feeling of resentment amongst some of the Poles themselves who really des desperately wanted to come and help Warsaw. But it would have been, they really did recognize that it would have been a suicide mission. Uh, and, and so it didn't it didn't go forward. And course. it wouldn't have been enough to make a difference anyway. For all no. that, a, a, you've got to land them in a city, which is with parachuting just isn't really possible. And B, it's, you know, we're, we're talking, um, you know, a brigade and it's not a it's not really a brigade in, in strength. It's a brigade. It's a brigade in name. Yes, exactly. So, and in fact, you know, it, and there, there's sort of evidence of this uh, because Stalin does make a sort of half hearted as a sop to Churchill and Roosevelt as to send a few hundred um, Berlin 
uh, army soldiers, Soviet soldiers of Polish origin uh, across the Vistula River in a, in a sort of half-hearted attempt to help the Poles. But it's a complete disaster. Most of the, the guys are shot up when they're trying to cross, in, cross the river. Um, uh, and then those who do come, of course, they're, they're way better equipped than the Poles, but they're not used to this sort of hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat in an urban setting. So many of them are, are captured or killed. Uh, and um, and, it, and it, it doesn't make a dot of difference to the outcome of the yeah. uprising. But it, it just does, it shows you just how incredibly valiant the the the, the defense of Poland was by the, the you know these these increasingly running out of supplies uh, poles these patches sixty three days it's just absolutely incredible how they held on for so long with everything crumbling in around them um, yeah. just a, incredible bravery so where where are we coming up to now Alina. We're still on Oli Tasmonikovskiego, but yeah. I'm going to throw something in there uh, before we reach our final destination. Is And I have to mention her because I know her granddaughter is listening and her daughter is listening. Um, it's about my ultimate hero, uh, who unfortunately she died in uh, 2016 and 17. And uh, her name is Helena Pashkovska. For those who are uh, film fanatics, uh, you will recognize the name. She was, she was basic, she was Jewish. She got locked up in the Jewish ghetto and she managed to escape with her family. And um, her story is incredible. You can, you can find her story online. I'm not gonna go through all the details. And she actually ends up here living in Ulita Smolikovskiego. She was hiding at, a, at an artist house. And one day, which is the 1st of August, she hears shots and commotion. And she's wondering what's going on. She actually comes down from the building and goes into that teacher building that we saw earlier. They go upstairs and uh, she says, look, I, you know, I, I want to help. So basically they give her these helmets. They say, right, we're painting the Polish eagle onto the helmet. So she was painting. And then she said, look, she said, I don't want to stand here and paint. I want to fight. OK, I, I, I'm not made for this painting sort of thing. So they send her up to see Rafa, who was the next floor above. And he looks at her and he says, well, all right then, you can be our liaison officer. So if you uh, if you want to bring that photo back up, the one of the of the whole unit, she's actually right in the middle. She's the only woman in that photograph, and she ends up fighting with this platoon Rafalki for the whole sixty three days. And oh, there you go, Helena Pashkovska, an incredibly beautiful and incredibly brave woman. She fights this whole Warsaw uprising, the whole sixty three days, with no weapon. But she has a grenade. That's all she carries with her because she was afraid of having this weapon, but she still did an incredible job. And in one of the memoirs, she actually writes that she managed to get hold of some wine. And uh, she got all the boys in the platoon drunk one night. And uh, Rafael got really annoyed with her, locked her in a room, but she managed to escape through the window. Wow. So you can see there's a bit of humor, even though it was an incredibly dark and an incredible, horrible and hard time. There were still moments where they tried to feel normal. Yeah, no, and, and we can only thank you for your passion of sharing this. You were very nervous about doing this, and I told you you'd be brilliant. We knew Alex would be brilliant. She's the consummate. Brilliant. I knew you'd be brilliant as well, Alina, because your, your passion just comes through for your for the for these heroines and heroes. Um, so yeah, and I'm, I'm so grateful that you're sharing all these stories with us because they are truly amazing and that the audience is enjoying it. And um, yeah, we're 76 years on, so from these events beginning. So we're coming up to a monument again there, Alina. I, I'm, I'm guessing it's about another loss. Uh, it is. This is, yeah. this is my final stop to talk about this. So we've talked about Vola. We talked about other civilian massacres. So on the 3rd of September, everybody in this area basically left they withdrew towards uh, Midtown. And in this building here that we're looking at with this memorial, this was a field hospital called Alpha Laval. And inside uh, were some of the heavier wounded. Now, I recently discovered uh, a memoir by a fellow, fellow soldier of my grandfather's, which mentions that during the Warsaw, uh, the fight for the Warsaw University, he got wounded. And also his other friend got wounded and they were in this hospital. And as they were withdrawing, my grandfather burst into the hospital and he said, right, we're going. There was no discussion. 
he gave them a, um, my work, my English language has gone out the window, a cane, that's the word I was looking for. Um, so one guy had a cane and he carried the other to the Midtown section. And basically in the end, he saved their lives. Why? So he's mentioned the sadistic human being, uh, Derv Lange and his brigade. Yeah. They actually come here on the 6th of September. They enter this hospital and they shoot basically execution style seven heavily wounded soldiers. Not only that, they end up, as I mentioned earlier, I was going to talk about the priest. This is where he comes into the story. Father Michal Chatarovsky. Basically, then we have a picture of him there. He was with the, he basically refused to leave the heavily wounded. And he was taken out of the hospital as were 30 other inhabitants of this area here. And actually 31 were taken out. 30 were executed alongside Father Chatoriski. One survived. And the only reason we know about this execution is because of this one man that managed to survive. The bodies were doused in petrol and satellites. There was no evidence left of what happened here. Wow. So the murders didn't stop. They should have stopped on the 12th of August, but they didn't stop. You can find these, these plaques all over Warsaw that show 20, 30, 40 civilians murdered. Wow. And I'm going to bring Alex in here because I'm guessing for all the stories we know, there must be so many other stories that aren't known. I mean, the, 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 the loss of life was so incredible. There must be amazing stories that just no one survived so then that's exactly that's exactly right and the and the and the thing is that you know this is something that you've mentioned at the very beginning is that when you look at the eastern front generally speaking uh you're looking at numbers of deaths uh, murders violence brutality uh killing that is so off the scales that actually in context the Warsaw uprising is just one horrible event in, in a whole series of, of, of battles and, and massacres and, and, and partisan war and you know, so many other things. It was a, a totally different kind of war from what we see in the, in the West. And this is why, in a way, just studying wars, the Warsaw Uprising is a kind of microcosm of, of the level of evil and the scale of barbarism yeah. on the Eastern Front, generally speaking. Which, which is in, encompassed in books like, like uh, Tim Schneider's uh, Bloodlands, for example. They're, mm. they're just talking about the scale of destruction. And it's sometimes very difficult to get your head around how terrible it was out here. There's really nothing good happening. I, I live, my house is just outside of Warsaw, as I said, just in these battlefields um, where the, the battles were taking place between Walter Model and Rokossowski. Um, but just down the road from me is, a, is one Russian POW camp, for example, uh, in which there are 30,000 um, unmarked, I mean, unmarked graves. Uh, 30,000 Russian POWs, nobody even knows about it. That's sort of like the number of people who died in Dresden or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, and they're, they're, they're everywhere here. They're just, just tens of them. So it's really, uh, again, you know, three million Soviet POWs were starved to death. You know, three million people. You, you just can't you know, get those numbers. So by the time Derlewanger and von den Bach and, and all those guys, Reinefart, get to Warsaw, they are so brutalized and the human life means simply nothing. And they've been told for, for years uh, that the people who live in this city are, are, are worthless. Even, even worse, some of the um, uh, memoirs I had, of, uh, many of the memoirs I had of the German soldiers I would say, well, you know, it's really unpleasant work. We didn't want to be in Warsaw. It was awful, but the but the Poles deserved it because they were banditten. They started this. In other words, it was kind of pushing the reversing the guilt onto the the citizens of this city rather than actually uh, realizing that they themselves were were engaged in an enormous criminal act, effectively. Well, I mean, we've been at this um, amazing ninety three minutes, and I think it's time to begin to wind things up. Um, and we should, you know, we we have a couple of photos of the ruins of the city for those who haven't really understood just how how awful it was here. Um, the, the destruction throughout the city was just, you know, way too laced. I mean, as as, as Alex said, they're both during the battle, then deliberately afterwards as a as a reprisal, as a punishment, as just the, you know, on Hitler's orders there for these. Um, the, whoops, that's the wrong photo there. Hang on, I'll find the next one. This 
shares just with the other one of wins there. Um, and, and run through the statistics for us, Alex. I mean, we're 180,000 civilians, isn't it? Um, and it just, it's just telephone number numbers. It's, it's, yeah, it's insane. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in, it is insane. And, and what, what another thing it does do is, again, it's a kind of a, an image or picture of, of the vindictiveness of Hitler. Mm -hmm. You know, people, sometimes they, there's, the, as you said, people who fought in the West, whatever, they might've come across a nice SS guy or whatever, and they, whatever, and they're always good people in every organization or whatever, but the evil of Hitler and the people around him who, who deliberately and with such vindictiveness and such brutality and such violence felt that they had the right to treat the peoples who live in this area like, mm. like, like vermin. You know, and that and that's something that that the, the Warsaw uprising gives us just a little tiny glimpse into the mentality yeah. of, of this man who was sitting up in the Wolfschanze, uh, the Wolf's Lair, not very far away from here. I, I take my mm. groups from the World War II Museum there, um, and and you, you, you and these huge gigantic bunkers, and you can get some sense of this mentality of this paranoid, evil man who's sitting there pushing the pushing the buttons so that something like the massacres in Vola and, and the rest of Warsaw, and then the utter destruction of the city uh, can happen. And he knew exactly what he was doing. He, he, he did it with just absolute vindictiveness. He wanted Warsaw to disappear from the map. And Hitler and Himmler's um, justification was interesting. On the evening of the 1st of August, he goes to Hitler and finds him in this state of absolute fury. And he says, okay, Hitler, you know, it's maybe not the best timing, but um, but let's, you know, use this opportunity to just erase the city from the map, because it's a city that's always stood in the Germans way, the Germans rightful place in the east. So if we get rid of it now, then, you know, when we come back, um, because the, obviously the front was moving toward Berlin, but when we, you know, when we finally are victorious with our wonder weapons and stuff, we won't have to deal with these terrible poles and this terrible capital city, and we'll be able to rebuild it as what was going to be called Neue Warschau. New Warsaw, which was going to be, and there were plans and, and, and all drawn up for this new little German style houses with little red roofs and, and mm. you know, most of the buildings were, were to be destroyed anyway, and it was supposed to become a nice little German city. It's interesting because I, I had a bit of a comment come on my, my Normandy shows a couple of weeks ago about how I refer to it as being them and us, and I do have a tendency to call by the Allies as us and the Germans as, as them. And when I do a show like this, you know what, I'm glad I can refer to me as us and them as them, you know, because we haven't talked about tank tactics. We haven't talked about um, some other shows about operations. Well, we've got Operation Totalized next week with Mike Bechtold from Canada. We will be talking about brigade actions and, and flanking maneuvers and using our, uh, artillery barrages. We will be talking about those, the kind of the, the military geeky side of it. We haven't mentioned that at all during this show, and I'm really grateful we haven't because it is all about human, human actions between brave, good, on the people on the side of good, and against a terrible, terrible enemy who stood for something so, so evil. So I don't mind referring to ourselves as us and the Germans as them in this case, or the Nazis as them, let's be, let's, it's the Nazis. But Alina, we'll bring things to a halt fairly soon. Um, you've, it wasn't as bad as you thought it was gonna be, eh, Alina? You've enjoyed it in the end, haven't you? I know, it was great. I got to talk about my granddad, because I haven't uh, had- We love you talking about your granddad. Yeah, I haven't had a time to really grieve because we haven't been able to bury him, but this has been a brilliant time to commemorate him. So I really appreciate this opportunity. Well, honestly, that's all we've tried to do. We've, we've highlighted half a dozen people, including your family and Alex's family, and that's all we can do is to try and tell the scale of this operation through the eyes of a few people. And, and Alex's book does that um, as well. And there are other books about the Warsaw Uprising that, that cover it from New York. And then, of course, the, the 2014 documentary that is incredible. Um, I, although I haven't found the first with English subtitles. I had to watch it in Polish and just kind of get it all from the imagery. But, um, yeah, no, thank you very much. You know, your camera work, we have lots of comments about how good your camera work was and, um, and bringing these stories. And um, uh, we'll, we'll wind up the show in a minute. But, Alex, to bring it back to you, um, in terms of you know, uh, what would you like people to take away from from this initial introduction for some people here to the Warsaw Uprising? Well, it was a, a great tragedy uh, it, for Warsaw, for the Poles. Um, and, and there is, of course, this, this whole political context, which we really haven't talked about either. Um, but in the end, you know, it, it, there's some things worth fighting for. And, yeah. and, 
and freedom is is it it's the big one you know and and uh and and i guess the, the other big takeaway for me always because i spend my time uh, doing so much on the eastern front and it and it's just so brutal and and i just have to step back sometimes and say you know the most important thing is to look at the ideology that hitler put in place yeah. to all these people and they really believed in that they were doing the right thing by coming and you know mass murdering people they actually believed this this was cleansing this part of the world so that they were going to create this new wonderful civilization and and it hap it's happened since it's happened before and we all of us have to uh, remember that that the humanity is the thing that matters and to create societies that we have uh thanks to the men and women who fought with on whatever front to crush this kind of evil uh, and that we must just never uh let those sorts of thoughts and ideologies you know back into our lives so there's this constant struggle it's always around us and we have to just constantly remember what happens how terrible it can get if we let these instincts and ideas go absolutely incredible words and it, it makes me realize again that i must force myself to read books about some of the more tragic aspect, aspects because you know i tend to read about the normandy campaign and the ground warfare and it is it's not nice but it's there's a there's a it, it's this this i've got i've got books on the holocaust sit on my reading show i've got about four or five books on the go and i have to read a few chapters and put it away for a couple of weeks i just can't it's just so heavy going i have to give myself a break and read yeah. something about you know air combat where it's a bit more chivalrous and and then i sort of find myself okay i'll read about the holocaust again. i go back into it and this you know this this yeah. reading i've done for this show has it's been brutal i found my, about my about set myself reading about it but that's good yeah. that means that means i'm you know i'm 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 understanding exactly what you said there about how important it is to fight for freedom and how important it is to make a stand and so well i think we'll bring it to end now we've got some great comments coming in i think more people will find this show afterwards for that the afternoon is a bit of a busy time people i think we'll get a lot more views later on so um um Alina, you've been brilliant. I knew you would be. Uh, Alex, I knew you'd be brilliant. Um, I've been okay, I think. But for those watching, um, uh, this is my first event outside of Normandy. I'm, I feel it went rather well. I'm, I'm going to go into engaged smug mode now. That it went quite well. And um, we've got to uh, Mortan show on Friday. I'm looking forward to that. Two shows coming to you live from Mortan where the 30th Division American 30th Division held off against the German armored divisions going for Avranche on, on the Saturday. Another the operation totalized with Mike Bechtel, the Canadian historian. And as as usual, been Canadian historians watching it. I think they've got a real little niche market amongst Canadian historians, which is great because they're so very polite. And when they had little disagreements in the YouTube comments, all very it's all very nice and very Canadian. He said in a cliched talking about Canadians being nice kind of way. But yeah, again, click on the YouTube uh, the, the subscribe buttons and please, if you consider donating a couple of dollars every month via Patreon, we can help us bring you more of these things to you because. Um, I'd love to do this full time if all, if all comes well next year. It came out of, born out of lockdown, basically. I can't tour, no battlefield, no Americans coming to Normandy want tour, so I've got to do something. So, um, yeah, so any final, fi any final words, Alina? You yes. show? Give us a selfie, come on, give us a wave, give us a wave. Uh, I'm not very good with this technology sort there of we thing. Go. Hi, I'm, I'm going to be selfless and shameless and plug myself here. Um, go for it. listen. Want to listen to more of me and my amazing podcasting partner? Log on to History Hack. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, and we half the time talk about absolute rubbish, but we talk about all aspects of history. So, not just no, the history hack. I can thoroughly recommend it. Again, a born out of lockdown. I've listened to many, many History Hack um, shows, and they cover you cover everything from medieval dildos up to the uh, typhoons at war to, to, to Romans and every you've. Martin Luther King this week because you've got the American black history. So you've, there's not a historical subject you haven't tackled. So I, I enjoy them. And uh, I've been on a couple of your shows myself, which is nice. So thank you very much, Lena. We'll, 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 say, we'll speak to you again soon. Thank you so much. And, and Alex, again, thank you very much. Uh, Sarah was right. You. you are amazing. Uh, I, knew, I knew you should be right. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, have you enjoyed it as well? Yeah, it was absolutely great. We've got to get you out here. And, and you see that the, 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 the flip side of the story is how wonderful Warsaw is now, despite all of it, all it went through. It's, it's well, the, you see, we I have a little Facebook group with my buddies, Duncan and Colin, called Poland or Bust, because we were going to be going to Poland this November to do Auschwitz with Alina and various other places. And with lockdown and the fact none of us have got any money at the moment, I don't know when it'll happen, but it will happen. 
And we well, will get welcome. to Carlo. We want, I want to go to Stalag Luft 3. That's one of the places I want to get to. And yeah, that's, and, a good, that's amazing. I bring my group group there as well. Or well, maybe I'll sneak on one of the World War II museum buses sometime without saying well, that. I'd be happy to, 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 to show you around. So you're, you're absolutely love to. welcome. We should well, get thank you very much. I'm going to bring this to an end. It's been absolutely um, fascinating stuff. You've both been amazing. I've learned so much. So this is Paul Woodedge. Um, I'll, I'll better put myself on the screen for the last two seconds. Just saying thank you very much for watching. And we will see you all again. And click on that subscribe button. Thank you very much, everybody. Good afternoon. Right, stream's ended now. You can say fuck now.